Hi, everyone. Thank you for your patience. We only play for full concert halls, so we needed some <laughs> other people to come in here. Uh, welcome. This is a discussion uh, about after the office, reinventing where and how we work. If you're looking for hydrogen, I think that's next door. Um, <laughs> I'm Kevin Delaney. I'm the editor-in-chief and CEO of a company called Charter. We're a future of work media and research company. Uh, we focus on flexible working, inclusion, AI, and work, some of the topics that are core to the discussion we're going to have over the next uh, 50 minutes. Um, over the last two days, I guess, I've been surprised by the frequency with which I've wound up in conversations with people about some of the questions that are, that are at the core of the discussion that we're about to have. These questions are not resolved, and everyone is trying to learn from each other. And so some of the questions we're going to uh, address include, um, amid the profound changes of the past few years, what do we know about what fosters productivity, growth, and meaning at work? And how can employers build flexible workplaces that attract and retain talent while also maintaining organizational culture and connection? Um, so I'm excited to be up here today with two great speakers to talk about their experiences, what the research says, what some of the best practices are uh, for now and in the future. And I'm going to start with Tom Wilson on the far left. He's the CEO of Allstate and has been amazingly since 2007. Uh, Tom has been an advocate for business playing a broad role in society through initiatives such as providing living wages and improving diversity and equity. Allstate employees nearly uh, it employs 57,000 people. Yes. Um, and now has remote and hybrid as the dominant setup for its workplaces. And we're going to get back to that in a, uh, in a few minutes. And also, I have uh, Joanne Lipman, who's here with me. Uh, she's the author of a new book, which is called Next The Power of Reinvention in Life and Work. She also wrote a great uh, bestseller called That's What She Said. Joanne has been the editor in chief of USA Today. Uh, Condé Nast Portfolio, The Wall Street Journal's Weekend Journal. She teaches at Yale, and many of you probably have seen her on CNBC, where she's a regular uh, contributor. Joanne has been writing and speaking for the past several years about the role of the office and the redefinition of work. So welcome, Tom and Joanne. Thank you, Kevin. Good to be here. So we're going to talk for probably roughly the next 30 minutes, and then there'll be time for questions or reactions. So, um, so if you have those, note them down, and we'll come to you. Um, after that stretch. Uh, Tom, I want to start with you and hear about the experience at Allstate in terms of remote and hybrid work and how it's been going so far. Uh, well, it's, it's going well, uh, is what I would say. The, when people are a little surprised, uh, in the United States, we're 82% permanently remote from home. Uh, we were 20% before the pandemic, but we're now at 82%. We're less so in our international locations because they don't have the... Uh, uh, housing infrastructure and technological infrastructure, particularly in India, uh, Northern Ireland is a lot like the United States. Um, and uh, so we did that, though, because we decided to treat our employees as customers. Uh, so rather than uh, supplicants we pay and you do, uh, we said, look, we're selling you a job. If you kind of think about it that way, that job comes with some money. Uh, it comes with an opportunity to uh, personally grow, professionally, whatever. It comes with a chance to make an impact on what we do with our business. It comes with it some you know, camaraderie, friends you can meet and stuff like that. And we added, during the pandemic, flexibility. Uh, and I would tell you, flexibility really sells. <laughs> People really, and you think about your own life, like don't you love flexibility? You get to get up in the morning, and decide what you wanna do. Our employees decided they wanted that and we're finding a way to, we're gonna find a way to make it work. And so you said, just to underscore that, 82% of your staff in the U.S. is is fully remote, is that right? Yes, yeah, we went through a process where uh, both top-down and bottom-up, uh, where we uh, top-down, we said certain departments need to be together. So like our investment department, the traders, they need to be together. Like we just know they need to be looking at each other, looking at their screens. But there's a lot of other people who don't need to be together. So uh, we then gave people choices from that. Uh, and I think of the people we gave choice, 95% uh, said they wanted to work permanently remote, didn't want to come to, into an office. Uh, as I uh, often say to our people, commuting is way overrated. <laughs> We're going to come to this. I'm going to pull you in in a second, Joanne. And we'll come back to this later, Tom. But the other striking thing is what you've done with your headquarters. Can you share that? 
Uh, we sold it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so our headquarters, you know, we had a traditional suburban campus, mile long, half mile wide, two million square feet, uh, and nobody was coming in. Uh, and we're like, well, this is not a good plan because uh, you got to heat it, cool it, make sure it doesn't get moldy and all kind of stuff. So we sold it. But I think probably the more interesting thing, Kevin, is uh, we didn't declare we had a headquarters. So uh, it was in suburban Chicago. Uh, the mayor of Chicago really wanted us to say Chicago is our headquarters, uh, and we've resisted that. We've said we'll always have a big presence in, but we don't have a headquarters because I'm kind of like, I don't know what a headquarters is anymore. Like a headquarters used to be like, you know, the center of power. You came there to get noticed and be saw seen by people and move up the thing. And like, we don't have one of those anymore, so we don't have one declared. And I imagine some people watching, listening to you are, are saying, but, 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 what about culture? What about all these things? And we're going to come to those in a minute. Um, Joanne, how, what is the, the kind of broader experience of flexible and hybrid work? How are, what is the landscape for this? Yeah, yeah. So, so I've actually spoken to several hundred people over the past few years as I've been digging into this and doing the reporting for Next, which is looking at how people transform their careers, their lives, the way we work, live, lead. And what has been so striking in these past few years, just to, to go to the 10,000 foot level for a minute, is the idea of we have changed our relationship to our jobs. And there has been a fundamental shift in society. And I think it started with the pandemic, certainly, and the fact that knowledge workers were all suddenly sent home and had this different way of looking. But you add to that, you know, the, the other stressors in life and the other, um, you know, the political, the polarization, the economic uncertainty, and you add that all together. And we're really at a moment where so many people are feeling unmoored. And they bring that with them to work. And I, so, you know, one of the ways that we saw that, I mean, we heard through the pandemic things about the great resignation and the quiet quitting and everything, but I think it's all part of the same issue. Um, there's been a few studies that show that people who are leaving their jobs, uh, a large proportion of them are actually looking for new careers. And so we're sort of rethinking and it's all up in the air. And I think that that has led to a lot of the uncertainty. Um, we, we had been talking earlier with, with Tom, and I'd, I'd love to hear you opine on this as well, talking about sort of where we are versus where we will be, because we haven't gotten there yet. Um, but what we do see, I mean, I think, look, the, what, what I'm hearing are the, the pros and the cons. And as somebody who used to run a newsroom, I understand the pros of getting people in the office. You want them there so that you have that flexibility, you have that, that, that um, you know, the, the incidental meetings in the, in, in the cafeteria line or in the elevator, and great ideas come from that. Um, and I understand that, and the mentoring piece, all of those things that I know Tom is going to address as well. Um, and then on the other side of that, though, you do have what I hear, the number one thing I hear from people is that they feel that the return to office is arbitrary. They don't understand why they are being called in. And a corollary of that is they makes them feel that their bosses do not trust them. So you've got a trust issue. Uh, going on here, and and that's really um, so. You have a disconnect between kind of the bosses and the the people at home. And I do also think when you're working at home, because you're not part of the hallway conversations and everything, if you don't hear from your boss for a day or two or three, you start imagining like what is what's going on. Like I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get who knows, right? You start spinning these things in your head, and so the the the, the lack of communication can be an issue. And then the, the one other thing I would say is that um, a lot of the disconnect also goes to um, particular groups. So, so when the companies, not yours, but companies that are, that are mandating you must come back to the office, it disproportionately harms women and people of color, who are the people who are most likely um, to, to want or to need that kind of flexibility. And there's even been research that shows that when you have a remote job opening, you get actually more diverse candidates applying for that job. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hearing, just to connect the things you've been saying, part of it is that there's this period where people have been sort of post-pandemic or through the pandemic reassessing their relationship be to work. And part of it is uh, workers wanting more flexibility and to Tom's point about 95% of workers given the choice actually uh, chose flexibility. Is that is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that there, what we found is, you know, there, with all the negatives of the pandemic, 
people have grasped on to what were the positives of the ability to have hybrid or remote work, whether it's spending more time with your loved ones or being able to, you know, that, that commute is just a killer. Um, and so there's so many positives that people want to take away. Um, but on the other hand, we have to balance that with what we're losing. I mean, you know, one of the pieces of research that came out recently was about Zoom, and it found that Zoom is a creativity killer. Not surprising, right? Like, who has their best idea sitting there staring at a screen? Um, so there's a reason for that. But, but you, so you, you have much better ideas, and it's much more free-flowing um, when you can all be together in a room like this. Um, what do you, in terms of the tension points that you see in terms of flexible arrangements, what do you, what are the principal ones that you're, that you've encountered having rolled this? The out? tension points. Yeah, yeah the tension um, points. Um, Where you have to work a little bit harder to. Yeah. To work. Um, well, first, I want, I want to go up Joanne's something I think is really important uh, is that, you know, she has this concept that uh, when you have something traumatic happens, like you change somehow, right? And that can be bad or it could be good. Uh, and it can be so if that's true with individuals as you were describing I'm like I think that's true for society as a whole in the workforce uh, And you think about it. We're all in this workforce together. So um, Some of the tension is not being treated well and people think well, you don't trust me or you know You're just making me come in like why are you making me come in like I'm perfectly happy and like why come in and do a zoom call and then you go in and nobody else is in the office. So you got the systems theory So you're the only person there. It's completely and I've done that guy like going in the office but I'm not going to make everybody come in all on some certain day. So you got to give them a reason. I think the tension point is making them come in to do something they don't need to do uh, in an office uh, is, a, is a bad idea. If there's something you come in and do something in the office and it's rewarding for you, it's personal growth, and you have fun, and you feel it, then you're happy to come in. So I think the tension is as we go down this growth, like, we don't know where we're going. We're just in motion. Like, I'm not, I don't think we'll stay at 82%. I don't know where we'll be. Like, I don't have a number or target. I'm not like, oh, if we get to 75, we'll get it. What we decided to do is we're just going to jump into the water and see where it goes, let people choose. We got rid of about half our real estate, saved hundreds of millions of dollars a year with the concept that, you know, like, we need to get real estate left. There's going to be some around. <laughs> you know, like because because we don't think we're going to use 100 percent. So so for us, it's like we're just in motion. And I think some people were kind of we're like we're done with COVID and they just want it to be done. And like, I, I don't know where we're going, but I think it's going to be good. And I'm willing to, like, find some better place to go. So your, your point is we, we it's a lot of the anxiety, I think, is people want to go back to where things were at before. And what you're saying is that you don't know where we're going but it's not back, and you're, you're trying to figure out as you go along. Is that a fair? Yeah, and I think we should go together. Like, I think, you know, like, I don't think I have all the answers, and, and if I did, our people wouldn't necessarily follow me anyway, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know, how many people said, oh, you got to be, I mean, you know, like a bunch of my friends in New York who run financial services companies, you know, made this declaration, you will be in the office, and nobody came in. Yeah. Like, okay, like shows you what power you have as a CEO, you know, like <laughs> zero. So, you know, you go with the flow, treat them as customers, treat them with respect, and then they'll come with you. Very candid CEO <laughs> comment I, <laughs> to make. To make. I, I appreciate that. I want to uh, walk through some of the objections people have to these arrangements in a second. But first, Tom, you, you said the challenge in that your, um, some of your peers are having this particularly acutely, as you just said is you make people come into the office and it feels very arbitrary. Um, so what is, the, what is your thinking about how to do it in a way that it isn't, doesn't feel arbitrary? That when you want people in the office, it is actually meaningful? Um, well, we don't know yet, but I'll tell you what we're trying. So the first is we're thinking about the whole work experience. So not just uh, what happens in the office, but how do we make that remote experience better? So we, like, there's some really good things here. Like, we can have, we, I just have to go around the country and do town hall meetings with, like, 500, 1,000 people to try to get their employees. Now we do a Zoom call. We get 20, 30,000 people on the call at once. Saves me a bunch of time. Saves them having come for a meeting. If they're boring, if I'm boring, they can click off. Like, you know, <laughs> it's just better. Uh, so we took those meetings, and now we had, uh, like, Arthur Brooks, I know, is speaking here, I think, tomorrow on happiness. We had Arthur Brooks come in and talk to our employees just about happiness. 
chat went crazy. Like you couldn't believe how excited people were. So I think there are ways you can think about outside the office, how do we make that experience rewarding? I think leaders have to figure out how to do that. I quite honestly, I don't know that I'm that good at it, and I don't know that the rest of our leaders are that good at finding ways who, with your team who are working remote, when you click leave on Zoom or Teams, that you find some way to, to do the thing you would have done walking down the hall. So we're experimenting. What we're trying to create is uh, two things. One is we're, inve we're investing money in that. We call it connected and belonging because we think you don't get to join point. You don't get this sense of connectedness. You're isolated, right? Uh, but uh, and the other thing is thinking of uh, pods of offices. So rather than this big giant office complex with two million square feet, what if you have, and we have a pod, not clo we call it now Chicago Suburban, uh, up by our old office. It's like 50,000 square feet. We've got two different formats in it to see what kind of physical space people want. We're going to see if it works. We used to have three, and no one went to the third one, so we got rid of it. So we're kind of like, we're just going to try to figure it out, but not assume that it's back to the either the bench rows of computers or the rows of cubicles all in some big office, because it really didn't work that well anyway. You know. Yeah. Um, Duane, you mentioned a few of them, but I'd love to walk through some of the objections to hybrid and remote work that people have, or anxieties or concerns, whatever you want to call them. And maybe we could talk through how you, what, put, put them in perspective, like how, you, how significant you think they are, both of you. Um, the one, one of the arguments is that there's less mentorship of younger workers. How are they going to learn how to do their jobs if they're not in the office? There are fewer encounters to connect people to their colleagues. It's harder to have a strong corporate culture. Workers are less productive when remote. It's harder to do creative and innovative work over Zoom, to your point. The experience of in-office workers is bad if they're on Zoom all the time with remote colleagues. So we well, could I feel like I'm in the hydrogen thing. I just blew <laughs> up the company. <laughs> <laughs> Must be in the wrong room. Yeah. <laughs> all that's going to happen. Woo. Yeah. Well, I'd love to talk. These are, you know, these are very real uh, concerns people have and reasons specifically that companies are not adopting as flexible configurations as Allstate is. Do you want, do you want to take, take a few of those and, and Yeah, talk sure. I mean, that's an exhaustive list, but there's even more than that. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so look, I think that the, the, these are all legitimate issues. I do think part of, the, part of the problem in every one of these issues is there is a disconnect between the bosses and the employees. And, and you touched on this with the idea that your finance friends are saying, come in the office, and people are like, no, <laughs> right? So, um, but I think part of it is that the, this disconnect comes from what, what Tom was talking about, which is this idea that um, we've been through a trauma. We have been through a trauma. And, and one of the, one of the um, areas that I write about in Next is actually about post-traumatic growth. The idea that after you've been through a trauma, it, you can't bounce back to where you were before. Um, but what psychologists who study this will tell you is you can bounce forward. And bouncing forward means you're going someplace different. And I think that in a lot of organizations, we're still trying to bounce back. And the employees are like, no, I can't go there anymore, right? So they, they, we need to, to work with them. Um, th there's a really interesting concept with this. It's post-traumatic growth. There's a really interesting concept with it that I think applies to businesses, which is it, with individuals, when they have a trauma, the psychologist will say you need what they call an expert companion. And that is somebody who knows you well, who can reflect back to you your strengths, who can help you see things with better perspective. I think there is a corollary in the corporate world, and you alluded to it, which is you need to actually be listening to your employees, your customers, your clients, um, to, to kind of together, we've, we've got to figure out what this new world will be. I will say there is one caveat here, which is if the economy tanks, forget, you know, and, and if, if we're all losing our jobs, the boss can say anything he wants and we'll all go back five days a week. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, neither of those things happen. Hopefully, actually, hopefully. The economy you tanks. Um, yeah, I, I think I'd say a lot of those are, are true, but whether they're true at 100% of your employees are true for some people. But then I'm like, that's just a problem to work on. That, like, just because you don't have mentorship doesn't mean that you're going to, you had perfect mentorship when you were in the office, you know? So yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of like, you just got to kind of make it up as you go. And like, so I do think, uh, isolation is not a good thing. I mean, we know that, right? Uh, and, um, so being in a room in your 
house on a Zoom call is not like being around people. It's somewhat isolationist. And because you, not only is it just bad for your, your mental health, it's bad for, I think, your life in general. Like if I think about our employees, I want them to have a good life experience with us. And you lose random events. And if you think about your own life, you know, how many random events have dramatically shaped your life, right? Like, you know, I met my wife at a birthday party where they were, you know, throwing peanuts on the floor. I, 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 had I not gone, I never might not have never met her, right? And so we all have friends. You meet somebody who knows your kids or, you know, and you have lifelong friends. So by being isolated, you don't get random events and you don't get it. That said, that doesn't mean that coming to an office, sitting uh, behind a screen is going to So I think it's incumbent on us with our employee value proposition is to try to experiment to find a ways, ways to do it. So some of our leaders have pizza parties. Okay, I don't know. Like we're, we've allocated money to try a bunch of stuff uh, and see if it works. Um, so there are, two, there are two of the things on the list I want to ask about your experience with very specifically. One is productivity, because that's a, one of the concerns people uh, raise. And then the second is culture. How do you, as the leader of a, an organization, have confidence that you will have a strong culture uh, a few years from now? Um, well, productivity, you know, you can measure. So it depends, like, coders, it's easier. You know, our coders actually seem to be more productive. Um, I think where we'll lose it is in the cross function productivity. So it's so if you're a product person and you're doing our pricing and that kind of stuff, you can get your team together, you can have pizza party, you can do that kind of stuff. But like the odds that you run into a claim person uh, uh, it, that is low. So I think that we haven't figured out. Um, but um, so I think on culture, I think this is going to raise the bar on culture because culture can be transmitted physically. So I'll give you an example. One of our daughters uh, for her semester abroad went to Mali, uh, and, uh, which is a, a country where women enter through different doors uh, and people eat with their left hands. Uh, physical things. Uh, you would not think, at first she's incredibly independent, never did anything I said. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, suddenly she's going through the other doors and eating with her left hand and explaining to me why that's not a big deal because she needs to fit in. So culture is just like you walk into a building, you walk into an office, you see the way, and you, it just becomes part of you. I think in this hybrid world uh, and with the pace of change, uh, whether that's pace of change on the diversity of your workforce or pace of change with AI and the other stuff, culture becomes a higher bar. And I don't think as a management science we have good processes around culture. Like if you ask people what the definition of culture is, it's sort of like, you know, pornography. You know it when you see it. And like if you look in the dictionary, you know, like nobody, it, it's got a crappy, it's a, it says like culture is culture or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we don't have, we, we tried to develop our own answer. So to come up with four components of culture so that we can actually measure stuff on it and see if we're making a difference. So I think it's going to raise the bar on culture. Can I add one yeah. thing, on, uh, particularly on the culture front? I think it's a, a, an especially important issue for younger people, like mm. all of our kids who are coming into the workforce or are young in the workforce, um, because they, they had both the COVID experience where they had a few years of remote, and so they sort of lost out on some of that socialization, and now they're coming into a workforce where maybe their bosses aren't there. Um, Kevin and I both spent many years at the Wall Street Journal, and I think we learned how to be reporters by listening to the more experienced reporters sitting around us, right? And so, um, you know, you think about that, that's sort of an extra layer of difficulty that I think we're probably only just starting to experience because those students are just starting to come in to the workforce. But there was a piece that some of you probably read, it was I, the Times or the Journal, about how business schools are starting to give courses on really basics, like how to conduct yourself at a cocktail party and what to order in a business <laughs> lunch, right? Because the, they just, they don't have the skills. And I think, I think one thing, just to react to that, I think one thing that we're, we're realizing also is that you can be deliberate in how you, fo you tackle these questions. So you can, re you can create cohorts of younger workers with structured men mentorship, you can have requirements that they're in the office, more than older workers, that, that kind of thing. I want to uh, come back, Joanne, to um, 
something you, you touched on briefly at the very beginning, which is the, the, uh, the inclusion uh, dimensions of this and, and ask the question kind of the opposite way. Like what is the, what is the workplace? What is the future of work that is more inclusive for women and, and underrepresented groups? Yeah. Yeah, so, so I, wanna, I wanna put out a statistic that really was absolutely stunning in a good way, um, which was in the month of April, we had the single highest female employment percentage in the history of the country, right? More than before the pandemic, um, which had been at a high. And so why do we think that was? I mean, I would gather, though we haven't looked at the studies, there haven't been studies yet, but it, it follows that because we have this opportunity to have remote and hybrid work, you have women who are able to participate in the workforce. And we have so many millions, hundreds of millions of women who would like to participate in the workforce, but it simply isn't possible to work it in with their lives in the way that the workforce has been structured. So I, I think it's, it, it, it would be so um, it would be so tragic, honestly, if we were to, to blow that, right? Like the fact that we can have these women back in the workforce, the fact that we also have, um, I believe it's historically high, uh, people of color, um, black workers in the workforce. And it, again, all of these things are terrific, but I, I think the, the, what we have to be concerned about and what we really have to be very intentional about is as we're thinking about trying to have more presence, having more in-person, more hybrid, work, how do we preserve what's good about it? How do we, how do, we do that? And it, it's, it's a difficult question, right? But, but um, you know, mothers of young children, women who have elderly relatives, um, people of color who, who feel like it's, it's, it's just less emotional stress to have fewer microaggressions. All of those things we know, uh, it's a positive in the remote hybrid world. And so we need to figure out how to preserve that. Tom, in, in your remote, in your time remote, are you seeing any impact on the diversity of your recruiting, your the inclusion among your staff? Yeah, yeah, it's, and it's huge. Uh, but but it's um, so first, we're when you look at our diversity numbers, we're better than most, uh, but we think we can be better. So uh, and uh, it's not like we're starting at a really low bar. Uh, and I think our diversity hires are up uh, thirty percent uh, since we weren't remote. Um, and, uh, and some of that is you realize, uh, to Joanne's point, like we've got this machine that is not all that uh, accepting of differences. So let's say you're a, a mother who wants to work, but you have two kids in school, and you want to be able to take them to school and pick them up at school, but you still have time you want to work during the day. If you had to drive 22 miles to come to our office, drive 22 miles back to school, 22 miles, you, you couldn't work for us, right? Uh, and now you can. Uh, our office was in the northern suburbs of Chicago, and Chicago gets whiter and more uh, less diverse the farther north you go. So people from the south side didn't come work for us. So our numbers are way up. Um, but I think there's there's another thing that we've done that I would it, is really encourage people is we lowered the number of uh, jobs that require a four year degree. So 54% of the people we hired last year did not have four-year degrees. Uh, and if you want a diverse uh, workforce, you know, I think uh, something like 70 or 75% of black Americans have not finished a four-year degree. So if you want to increase your representation in that cohort and you're only looking fishing for one of four, not a good, and you know, the answer is, do you really need to have a college degree to do a bunch of these jobs? You know, like is, like a, you know, all of my kids have liberal arts degrees, so like, you know, but is that really going to make them like a data analyst? Uh, probably not, but maybe they can figure it out. So um, I think we've seen it as a, a great uh, benefit to us. Uh, now, the challenge we have, which is, you know, all these things come with challenges, is then you get them spread everywhere, okay? Uh, and so you're like, well, then what's your opportunity to actually be able to get them to come back physically and have some connection and not be isolated. So right now we're kind of toying with, we have seven, we've had seven talent centers around the country. Do we kind of ring fence it and say, look, you got to live within 50 miles of one of our talent centers because it's, there's at least some place you can come or can we create pods in it? But we can't have, we have two people in Des Moines. We're, we're not going to have, you know, 2,000 square feet of space for them. So it's, I'm just, it's complicated, but I think 
it was a real benefit to society. Do you, from your conversations with your peers, do you get any sense that what you've done, giving up your headquarters, rethinking, shrinking your real estate footprint, reconfiguring your offices, is that something that is happening more broadly? Or do you think over the next few years we'll see more of that as people real, realize the benefits? You know, I, it's, I mean, hard to say. Like, I'm not saying it's for everybody. Like, I'm sure there are some businesses where they need to be in the office every day, 20, you know, seven days, five days a week, whatever. Yeah. Um, and we just know what's right for us. And, and so um, I, do I think more people do it? Yeah, I think more people do it because when I look at the customer base, they don't want to go in an office. So, like, if you want to have people work for you at some point. Now, maybe if unemployment goes up, but I see this really as a structural Im unemployment issue, not just a recession. So I think a whole bunch of people, to Joanne's point, just said, this is not my life anymore. So they just checked out. So I think there'll be pressure on uh, employment for a while. And we haven't done anything on immigration, so we don't have anybody coming in. So like, okay, you know, what are the odds that, you know, there's going to be we don't have a surplus of people? Either, like, actually. I'm just not seeing it. But maybe, yeah. you know. Uh, we're going to go to questions in just a few minutes. I want to, before we shift over, I want to um, just ask about, and Joanne, I'll start with you, what you, you put all these things we've been talking about together, and it seems to me like the job of a manager is not identical to what it was in 2019. What, are the, what, is the, what does the new manager look like who is thriving in this area, in this era, and whose teams are, are thriving? And how is it different than what people learned in business school in 2012? Yeah, I mean, I think management has, to be a manager is a compl almost a completely different animal from what it was probably five years ago. I mean, in part because you've got to figure out how to work with, I mean, I've been a manager a long time and there is an ease of like having people right there and being able to call your meeting and you know, there, there's sort of the way you've always done things and you have to completely rethink not just how you do the business in terms of meetings and making sure that people collaborate and culture and all of those things, but just even just the, the pure logistics of how you are getting the work done. And also the human relationship, I think, is a huge piece of it. I think that managers now have to spend much more time invested in the human relationships because you don't just have them naturally. They don't just come through osmosis. They don't come through hallway interactions, the cafeteria, wherever, you name it. Um, and so you have to be super intentional um, about that. And you know, the, other, the one other thing I would say about leadership is, and I think this has been true for a long time though, is um, that we, we just haven't seen it, is that you really need to, to model the leadership, the, the leadership needs to model it. My, my, you mentioned the pre my previous book, which was about closing the gender gap. And one of the things that I found in corporations that were more successful in doing it, it starts with the CEO. It starts with this, it, it's not an HR function, it is a CEO responsibility and they take ownership of it. And I, I do think that we're gonna need to see more of that. And then the one other quick thing, but I really wanna hear from Tom, but the one other quick thing is that we, we do see that, you know, most CEOs got into their jobs because they were great at what they do in their organization and then you get there and suddenly you're expected to weigh in on climate change and on racism and on every other you know, Societal social issue. issue that's out there, which is not what you got the job based on. And I think that's, very, that's a tricky issue as well. Um, I want to ask you the same question, which is what is a good manager uh, look like today and how is it different from... Uh, I agree. I agree with Joanne. It's uh, it's going to be different. I guess I would say you just have to kind of think about it personally, and like what got you here isn't going to get you there, uh, and so you have to get your leaders to agree. Uh, and I don't know how many managers there are in America. I don't know, tens of millions of them. Like you know, we probably need to retrain them. Either that or give them Chat GPT or something. <laughs> like that. But, uh, um, but uh, I think you know, first and foremost, it's like you care a lot for your employees. Uh, uh, second, that you're really clear about um, what your, um, where your company's going. So like, here's our purpose, you know, here's what we're trying to achieve, here's what you want to do. I think it raises the bar on decision clarity. Uh, so it used to be you could walk out of a meeting, and if it wasn't so clear, there'd be a meeting after the meeting, or somebody walked by your office, what did you say over here, and I didn't understand it, you know. But now you click off Zoom and then they go off and you don't see them for three days. So I think as a, I'm finding it's harder for me to be clearer 
and more specific. And it takes extra work. Like, you know, you kind of get through with the meeting. You're like, okay, we're done. We've made, you know, good, good luck. Uh, and the old system used to prop that up. I don't think in terms of decision clarity that the, this system props you up. I think the same thing is true on feedback. Uh, so I don't know if you've read uh, Reed Hastings' book on feedback on what they do at Netflix. It's, it's a lot more aggressive than we do, <laughs> just put it that way. Uh, but they have really high margins, and their people add a lot of value, so maybe it works for them, uh, or it obviously does work for them. But um, the, the idea that you're really crisp and blunt with people so that uh, like when they walk out of that meeting, they're not wondering, as Joanne said, like, do they like me or not? You gotta be really clear. Like, yes, here's the feedback. That was really good. And normally you might not have to do it. So I think it changes what we have to do. And for us, those two elements, when we look at a culture and we break it into parts and we break it into processes and say, what are we gonna measure? Decision clarity and feedback are two things we're working really hard on. And you have to make the implicit much more explicit is one way to say it, to document yes, things. Yes, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, to say yeah. it really clearly. Uh, we're gonna go to questions right after this, but Tom, you mentioned ChatGPT, and it's it, probably impossible to have a discussion like this about the future <laughs> of work and leadership without asking whether generative AI will impact how we think about all of these dimensions that we've been thinking about, including flexibility and inclusion. Uh, do, you, do, you have any, do you have any early sense of that? Um, yeah, so first I would say um, in, the, uh, in the calm part of it, uh, we've been using things like AI for a long time. Like we price tens of millions of pieces of business. We decide whether a car is totaled. We, we do all kinds of algorithmic things. So that's kind of what AI is. It just, we've got these new chips and they process stuff a lot faster. And so it's, it's gotten much, much better. So we've been using it for a long time. People have been talking about it for a long time. That said, uh, we do seem to be at an inflection point and I think it's just gonna rip through the service economy. Uh, I think there are jobs just gonna go away. I mean, if you, uh, if you ask ChatGPT to write a, uh, an apology letter to a customer and you're able to give that, that, that algorithm uh, a customer file that's got some stuff in it, it'll be better and faster than a person. It can read the let file faster, it can figure out what works, it'll know how the person responded to it. So I think we're gonna have a huge opportunity in America because it's gonna create a whole bunch of efficiency but in the meantime, we got to figure out how we're going to take all these people who are not trained to do something else and figure out how to get them trained to do something that's meaningful to them. So I think it's a big deal. What you said is kind of chilling, what you just said, <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to say it. Um, and, and also, yeah. Yeah, I, well, I think, you know, we in, I mean, I, I know it's not an AI panel, but I think you know, the, the problem with the last time we did this called the internet and mobile connectivity and everything is we didn't redirect the profits. Yeah. We let all the profits sit in one place and the people who created those profits didn't get any benefit from it, uh, as in you. Uh, uh, and so, you know, how do we redo that? I'm not, I don't have the answer, but I just think we'd, we should be talking about it. I, I, I don't, um, I, I don't want to push back, but um, Good, if I got an apology letter from ChatGPT, I, I would not be happy. <laughs> In other words, I, I, wanna, I would like to know that my apology letter came from a human being. Um, yeah, um, but <laughs> if it's, <laughs> you know, would you know? Well, but that's the thing, you would like to, you would, <laughs> but that's the thing, you would like to know, you would like to know that there's a human behind it who has some empathy. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, maybe. I mean, maybe you'd be, we'd give you a special person, you'd pay for it. <laughs> or like somebody else might say, no, I want to pay, you know, 10 bucks less a month in insurance. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, that's, that's the world I live in. Uh, but I will tell you something we do right now. So when, when our customers get into an accident with somebody else and it's not their fault and we, we pay their claim, we have to go get that money back from the other insurance person. It's called subrogation. And oftentimes it ends up in arbitration because they don't want to agree, we don't want to agree. We use AI to write those briefs now. And it is better than people, okay? Because it knows, oh, this is a progressive one. If it's a progressive one, they're probably gonna get this arbitrator, so use this language. If it's a State Farm one, they do this. Our people, uh, I, I mean, I love our people. They're just, uh, you know, we can't process, so yeah. I, it's scary. But you know what, like, we're still gonna need people to work. America's figured it out. We just have to manage a transition. 
And there's a panel tomorrow uh, on work and AI that I'd recommend to you all, not only because I'm moderating it as well. <laughs> so with that, we're going to take uh, questions. If you want to raise your hand, we have microphones. Uh, maybe we'll start uh, back here and there, and then come to the front and work our way. And can you, you say your, na your name? Uh, just my name is John. And uh, if we can keep the questions sort of short. Yeah, I'll just be for very, everybody. very short. Thank this you. is a phenomenal panel. And by the way, kudos, Tom, to what you've done at Allstate. Incredible. And how you brought it. And kudos to your work as well. I have a super quick question. I heard the whole panel, and you said, well, wait a minute. If there's a recession and we get hit really hard, everyone's going back to work. So what does that mean? Does that mean that literally it's like, you know, then if, if, if the employees don't have the power, then all of a sudden they go back to work? So I'd be curious, is, and do companies work better because of that? So that's my question. We can't, uh -huh. hear, we can't hear you on the audio. On that yeah. I think they're recording it, though. So they're recording it. Here, we get to your microphone. Yeah. Keep it on really brief if you can. Yeah. Is this working? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, on that question, um, Silicon Valley Bank was touted, you know, it's flexibility. We, you know, we're the best commitment to remote work, and we're the only bank, J.P. Morgan and others, are requiring back to work, and, and we have, we're 100% remote, and they failed. So, so to the question of the gentleman back there, Yes, yeah. I would say those two questions are actually unrelated. I think Silicon Valley Bank <laughs> is a separate you, yeah. issue, probably another panel. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but what I meant when I said that is that we are in a position, and we have been for the past few years, where it's been a very tight employment market. And so the, the, the pa balance of power has shifted to the employees over the past few years. And uh, I was simply making the point that if the balance of power shifts back, uh, employees will have less of a say in what the office is going to look like. This is, this is a complete hypothesis, which has no fact behind it. But uh, I think in part the balance of power is shifted uh, is because employees realize they actually had power. They realize they I, actually I did, they yeah, have I, yeah, I think some of it is for sure employment and that stuff, but I think people finally said, no, you got to pay me more. And the company said, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, but on, on the on, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, I think there mistakes are made in remote environments and mistakes are made in in-person environments. Silicon Valley Bank went down because they had stupid asset liability matching practices. That could have been remote, that could have been in person. It actually started when they were in person. So I don't think I don't think you can blame SVB. Yeah, it's good, but I like they fail for a lot of other reasons, but not not because they take in the, the office. question the way back and then and then come up front here. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I have a company that started right before the pandemic that was meant and that puts women to work remotely, women and caregivers, so that they can do knowledge work from their homes. I have seen incredible, um, incredible gains, and in our revenues have increased every single year. I also have another company that, at, when the pandemic started, they were in an office and now have become totally remote. Our revenues have gone up every year with that company as well. My team loves being remote. There's no question. I feel like I would like to understand from you, how are people measuring productivity? So how are you measuring the productivity? I look at you know revenues. Um, I'm sure there are many other ways to look at it as well. And I'm really interested to hear what the larger companies and also some of these investment banks are making people come back and technology people are coming back. I assume they think it's for productivity gains that they think they'll have. Um, do you want to? Um. First, I think you should subscribe to Kevin's thing because he'll give you the answer as it develops. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Because uh, I don't really know. Uh, yeah. But I would say we measure a lot. We're, I mean, we're an insurance company, so we measure everything, right? Uh, we measure employee engagement. We measure absenteeism. We measure keystrokes. We measure customer satisfaction. We measure all that stuff, uh, and it's all pretty good. <laughs> what I, and what I would just add is that uh, if you're looking for details on this, Nick Bloom at Stanford has done a lot of the research and they've done randomized controlled trials of organizations and found that uh, hybrid workers are generally on average 2% more productive than in-office workers and remote workers are 10% uh, less productive. And his research makes the case for, for hybrid. We're going to go maybe right up in the front here in white and then, and then go over. Thank you. Hi, everybody. 
Um, so I, I agree with a lot of what you said, that the key right now is to curate connection. You're trying to figure out ways to do it in pods, and, and flexibility is great. I guess my question is, and I, I love, as a woman, I used to have to sneak out to you know, go take my kids somewhere, and so I, I think a lot of this is great, and I've read about the microaggressions. However, proximity bias is real, and so when you are in the office and certain people are coming in or certain people are deciding to go to the pods in, you know, outside of Chicago, um, you know, I might give my friend Martha here, a great project because we bump into each other. So, you know, how do you deal with that proximity bias? I guess for either of you or Joanne, maybe you start. Yeah, sure. I mean, proximity bias is real, and we have seen that in all of the research, but that is what we're exactly what we're talking about with this sort of remote hybrid, which is why we need to figure out a situation where we are inclusive of women, people of color, the people who need the remote work more. And that's also why I think that, um, that the demand to be back in the office five days a week or even four days a week um, is backfiring um, with a lot of companies. And ultimately, what will happen is because we have many different companies with many different models right now, there are more opportunities uh, for people to seek out the companies that are going to be more conducive to the way that they work. Um, and as a result, I think you're gonna, those companies that are too inflexible are going to have a, more of a talent drain. They're going to have more difficulty in recruiting and um, retaining people. And that, I've seen that in all the interviews that I've done where organizations that have had this built in this flexibility, they say that it definitely, definitely is one of the top, and I think you mentioned this as well, this is one of the top reasons for, um, both for recruitment um, and for retention um, that people cite. that companies will have flexibility and the men decide, well, I want to go in yeah. and the women are the ones taking, they're taking advantage of the flexibility. And so we'll have to see how it, you know, how companies address that, you know, from, from yeah, an Yeah, Tom was talking yeah, about, about that, that actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess I think leaders um, get paid to find and observe talent. Um, and so if somebody's not there, they, they should be trying to figure out, you know, is proximity bias getting in the way? Um, if proximity bias does create some, because it is easier, right? If somebody's there, you notice some more, you pay more attention. Um, I think people really have to think about your life in total and how do you want to manage it. And so I've seen people who are the, you know, suck-ups who are always in the office, only leave after you leave. Uh, and if they're not any good, they don't get ahead. So, you know, like proximity isn't a factor in and of itself. And so I think you have to like think about how you want to manage your life, find the things that where you can add value, uh, and manage your career like you'd manage a business. Like how am I selling to somebody? So um, I think it's, but I think it raises the bar. But we have we have that problem when we were in. Like I we recognized somebody the other day. Spent with this 35 years, and I was like, how was it this woman didn't get promoted sooner? I don't know. Like, this system just didn't work. She's promoted now. It's great. She's going to have a good career. But, you know, like, so the ma machines don't always work. Um, we're going to try and fit in two more questions. If you keep it quick. Thank you. Things that the intersection of a couple of thoughts that you shared, Tom. And one is the idea of distribu the distribution of place, right? That you're moving away from a headquarters, but you are investing in pods and the power of that place. The other intersection thought that has struck, that stuck with me is the concept of ex reimagining the experience of work, right? And that it's a much more inclusive, expansive definition of all the different pieces of life that contribute to one's experience of work. And I'm wondering when you bring those two together and you think about the power of place, the power of experience, and the need for these um, serendipitous connections, how you're thinking about community engagement, how you're thinking about the power of place-based engagement of your employees or groups of employees in your employment centers as a mechanism to enhance that experience outside of your home, but also outside of your office. Um, I mean, it's a complicated Thank question, you. and I, I don't want to give the impression that we've got all the pods figured out, so let me just, like, we're trying some stuff. That's what we think will work, but we'll see. Um, I would start at the most macro, and then I'll give a very specific example. So we say uh, at Allstate we have four people we take, four groups we have to take care of, our customers, our shareholders, our, our teams, our employees and agents, uh, and our communities. So that's part of, and that's right up in our shared purpose. 
on the communities, on the connection, we're actually experimenting with doing community-based events with departments in communities where they come together and volunteer together as a way to build that sense of connectedness, not around what's the spreadsheet or what's the marketing program, but around doing some. So, but uh, I, we think we have a good hands program. We do a lot of development uh, with our employees. We work with thousands of people, thousands of organizations around the country. Uh, and so tr we're trying to find, can we use that as another vehicle to create a sense of connectedness and belonging to all state, even if it's not related to a spreadsheet? We're gonna try and squeeze in one last question. Bonus round, very quickly. <laughs> Something you've heard from a mentor of yours that's still true that you want to pass on to us? Oh. Um, so I, I used to work with a guy named Ed Brennan, who was the chairman of Sears. Had 600,000 employees, and I happened to be in a store in Brooklyn with him. Uh, and this little old guy walked up to him and said, you don't remember me. And he remembered his brother's name, that his brother worked for him, but he had never met this guy, and the guy was thrilled. Uh, and uh, I said, that is amazing. Like, how do you do that? And he said, you do what's important. So people are really important. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the best piece of advice I got was actually uh, probably just very practical, which was when I became an editor, I was on page one of the Wall Street Journal, and my boss chose one story for page one over another story. And I said, I would have picked the other story. Why did you pick this one? And he said, the most important thing you can do is make the decision. And I thought that was great that's advice. True. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's, right. that's really good. That's right. Keep moving. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to end on that. That seems very, uh, very right way to end. Make the decision. Keep moving. <laughs> Don't go back. And if you're interested in this topic, there is another panel tomorrow where we're going to go deeper on the AI dimension of all of this. So thank you to Tom and Joanne. Thank you, well. Kevin.